This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the Young Israel of Kugarn Hills, where we continue in our series on Rabbi Huda HaChassid, the last will and testament of Rabbi Huda HaChassid. Today's shir is sponsored by Yerachmiel Weiss in honor of his close chaver, Pinchas Horowitz, who just got married. He should be Zoycha to build a Bayes of Israel and light up the world with his Torah. So we're speaking about the topic of marriage. Um, let us now, I would like to share with you a new possibility in the Tzavah of Rabbi Yudah uh, It's quite a novel possibility. It is not a possibility that any of the Poiskim entertain, but uh, a friend of mine in Florida who works on uh, publishing manuscripts of Rishonim, Zechariah Holzer, um, shared with me an idea that he had in the Tzavah Rabbi Yudachasid. So I'm going to share it with you. And uh, maybe we'll examine it. It's clearly not an idea that is discussed in the Poiskim, uh, possibly because they didn't have access to all of this information. Okay, be it as it may, the Rush, the great Rush, where did the Rush live? The Rush started off in Germany as a Tom Marami Rothenberg, but he had to run away when Maram was, uh, died in prison. And then he comes to Toledo, yeah? Toledo. In fact, if you look in the Magid Mesharim of the Beis Yosef, of the conversations he had with the Malach, the Magid Mesharim, uh, the Malach refers to the Rush as Asher Kadishi, the Holy Asher, the Rush. See, people don't know where the expression Holy Toledo comes from. So now you heard it here first. The Rush, who is known as Asher Kadishi, lived in Toledo, and therefore Toledo is a very holy city. Okay. But the Rush says uh, quite an interesting uh, concept at the end of Parshas Achrimois. The Rush tells us a historical uh, fact that we know that uh, not only is one allowed to marry their niece, again, according to the Torah, Rabbi Chassid forbid it, but according to the Torah, not only is one permitted to marry their niece, but the Gemara says in a number of places it's actually a great mitzvah to marry one's niece. Uh, for example... The Gemara in Yevamis on Samach Beis and Mebeis, and the Gemara in Sanhedrin Ayin Vav Mebeis says it's one of the four mitzvahs that if somebody performs, they will call out and Hashem will answer them immediately. Okay, remind me to tell you about the Gedolim who did in fact marry their niece. Okay, um, so I want to tell you about that today. So, but um, the Mishnah says uh, the Gemara says a great mitzvah to marry one's niece. Rabbi Yudah Chassid forbid it. However, even though it's a mitzvah to marry your niece, to, are you allowed to marry your aunt? No, it's uh, one of the arayos. So the rush brings down, <speaking in Hebrew> that which the nations of the world afflict us and embarrass us. <speaking in Hebrew> how, do we, how can we marry our relatives? <speaking in Hebrew> the daughters of our brothers and the daughters of our sisters. In other words, the Goyim say, you're hypocritical. You, the your Torah says marrying your aunt is an arayas, and you go ahead and you marry your, your nieces and nephew, right? Your, your nieces. And apparently the Rush is saying, this is something that in the Christian world, again, the Rush is living in uh, Germany and Spain, this is something they, they poked fun at us. They said, you don't keep your own Bible. And the Christians were very makbid not to marry their nieces. And they bothered us. Why do you violate your own Bible? So the Rush says, the answer is very obvious. Hashem told the Benoist Slavchad to marry Bnei Dodehem. We find the Nevi'im, Kalev gave his daughter to who? Asniel, his brother. It says Achiv. So the question is, how is this permitted? So I'm going to tell you a secret now. Do not repeat this at home. Do not repeat to your wives. And obviously there are probably only men listening to this. And uh, don't spread the word. Because if, if it gets out that I said this, you know, I'm a rabbi in the five towns, you know, who knows what's good. Anyway, so, the, what is a wife? What's the job of a wife? Says the rush, the job of a wife is to service her husband. That's the job of a wife. To, to feed, to take care of. The job of the wife, says the rush, is... Shenitna ha'ishal ish l'sharsai. The job of a woman is to serve him, and that's the honor of a woman to service her husband. Isha k'shera oisin rutzayin bala. So now here's the thing. You know why you're not to marry your aunt? It's 
It's a lack of kibud of a. In other words, what the rush wants to know is what's the difference? Why are you now to marry your aunt and it's a mitzvah to marry your, your niece? Says the rush, very pashat. You're now to marry your aunt because the job of a wife is to service her husband. If you're going to be having your aunt service you, it's an embarrassment to your father. It's not kibud to your father. Your father's sister is going to be cooking you a, a dinner and cleaning up. It's not nice for your father that his sister should be servicing you. It's a lack of honor and respect to your father. Masha'in Cain. If you marry your niece, so for her, it's an honor to her father that she's servicing his brother. So it's a very pasha distinction. You know how to marry your aunt, it's a lack of kibbut of aim. It's a mitzvah to marry your niece, that's a fulfillment of kibbut of aim. That's the pshat of the rush. So, um, Rabbi Holzer suggested, but let's look at the Rush's question. The Rush is addressing not just the question, but he's pointing out that the Goyim poked fun at us. They instigated, they, they mocked us. You don't keep your own Bible. So is it possible then that Yudah Chassid was not issuing his admonitions out of some kind of a spooky rationale or supernatural He's saying just, uh, just a very common sense, very practical, that if you're living in a Christian world, it ain't a good idea to do what seems to be an open violation of the Bible. Don't marry your niece, because they're going to be mocking you. Now again, clearly the Paiskim did not understand that the, this, this way. In fact, Rabbi Vadya and Achuva, Rabbi Vadya, now I'll, I'll point out that he also mentioned to me that in the Christian world, two brothers can't marry two sisters. I didn't, you know... I didn't check that up. But, but be it as may, is it possible then that some of these admonitions, which to us a thousand years later seem to be, you know, heebie-jeebie, could be just practical considerations living a thousand years ago in Germany? You know, in Germany they had different philosophy in general. There are certain things that we find in the uh, Rishonim of Germanic origin. For example, the concept of Tshuva Samishkal. Shuva Samishkal is for every Avera, there's sort of a list of how many days you need to fast, how, how much you need to afflict yourself. This is a concept that's found in the Rishonim from Germany, Shuva Samishkal, that you sort of weigh the benefit you got from an Avera and you equally afflict yourself. We don't do this anymore. But they, they lived in a very ascetic society. Another, uh, another example, you know, we once mentioned the fact uh, the Rabbeinu Ephraim writes that Binyamin was a werewolf. It was a different society there. In, but be it as it may, is it possible that these, this is part of the rationale for Abihudah Chassid? Again, it's not assumed that way by the Paiskim, but it's an interesting idea. But by the way, once we're on the subject, I'll share with you um, a comment of, the, of Chazal in, in the Sifra, in the Taras Kayanim, and we'll ask you a question. So you're passing by McDonald's or Burger King, or KFC. Ugh, yeah, disgusting! Uh, egg, uh, you know, ham and eggs, uh, um, cheeseburger, it's despicable, how could you mix the two to have dairy and, what a kind of disgusting, uh, or, should you not say that? In fact, Chazal say, don't say that. The Lashon of Chazal, that Rashi quotes is, Minayin shaloyomer adam nafshi katsa bebasar chazir i'evshi lobosh klayim God, you should say, there's nothing smells as good as ham and cheese. There's nothing that, that feels as good as you go boss full of shotness. There's nothing that looks as good. But, what could I do? God told me not to do it. So from here we see that Chazal say, you should say, I would like to sin, but what could I do? God told me not to do it. That seems to be supported from the, by the fact that Chazal say, Lefum Tzara Agro, who's going to get more reward? Someone who walks by McDonald's and the only thing he ever ate in his life is kosher delight? And says, bah, uh, this doesn't taste like the, the kosher deluxe hamburger that I'm used to. Or a guy who, let's say, has eaten McDonald's in his life and now is really tempted by it and overcomes that, he gets more reward, Lefum Tzara Agro. Okay, on the other hand, the Rambam in the Shemayna Prakim, Parag Vav, asks, that in Tanakh, it seems like the opposite. It says, Nefesh Rasha Ivsara, the soul of the wicked desires bad. It seems like the soul of the tzaddik does not even desire bad. Simcha la tzaddik asois mishpat. It's a joy for a tzaddik to do the right thing. 
What do you mean? No, it should be difficult for a tzaddik to do the right thing. So from Tanakh it would seem that someone who's able to make it that he doesn't even want to sin is on a higher level. After all, I have a question. Imagine somebody, you were a principal in a school, and you, uh, you interviewed a young man, and, and you said, the young man, by the way, do you own a, a gun? He says, yeah. Not only that, every time I come into the school, I wish I could blow everyone up, but what could I do? God told me not to do it. How comfortable would you feel about allowing this? <laughs> Imagine if somebody told you, you know, I really would like to take this hammer and knock everyone on the head, but what could I do? God told me not to do it. So as difficult as it is, is that really the right? Imagine somebody said, I wish I could rob every bank I went into, but what could I do? I control myself. Does that sound like a, a proper madriga? No. Yeah, that's what Yishka is all about discipline. Yeah, but, I mean, who's on a higher madriga? Somebody who says, I would like to shoot everybody, but I don't? No, because you're hurting somebody else. It's, not, this is it's when, you, when, when you... So you want to say, Bein Adam L'Chaver, Bein Adam L'Makam. So let's say somebody says, I wish I could, Chas Hashem, be Mavare Chas Hashem. But what could I do? God told me not to do it. I'm not talking about normal is that, behavior. Is that a proper thing to do? When you, when you don't do some normative behavior because Hashem told you not to do it, mm-hmm. that's a sign. You, you know, we know who's uh, running the show here. Mm-hmm. But when you try to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not doing some non-normative behavior. Oh. So the Rambam says, it depends what type of mitzvah we're talking about. If it's a mitzvah that had the Torah not given it, you still shouldn't do it because it's logical and reasonable, right? Like killing and stealing then this is not proper behavior, whether Torah commanded or not, then it's inappropriate for a person to say, I wish I could hurt everyone, I wish I could harm everyone, I wish I could steal, I wish I could be dishonest, but the Torah says not to do it. No, you shouldn't want to be dishonest, you shouldn't want to hurt people. But if it's a chayk, like eating treif, or wearing shatnis, where had the Torah not commanded it, we wouldn't have to do it, then no, a person should say, I wish I could do it, because the only reason not to do it is because Hashem told me not to do it. Here's where it gets tricky. Because in this Rambam, when the Rambam says that when it comes to mitzvahs that are only tradition and don't have reason, a person should want to do it, the Rambam says like, Basar Bechalov, Levisha Shatnis, and Arias! Arias! And Arias! A person should say, I would like to do Arias, but what can I do? God told me not to do it. So the Rambam groups and categorizes Arias as what? Chukim. Okay? The problem is, if you look in the Gemara Numa, Daf Samach Zayin Amar Beis, Tan Rabbanon, Es Mishpatai Ta'asu, Dvarim She'omolei Nechtavu, Din Hu She'yichtavu. Mishpatim are dinim that had they not been written, should have been written. Like what? Avoy Zara, Gilei Arayos, Shvi Chazdamim. So the Gemara says that Arayos are Mishpatim. But chukim shehasatan meishem aleim, for example, chazir, levisha shatnes, yibum, mitzoyra, sar mishaleach, those are chukim. So the Rambam's against the Gemara, because the Rambam categorizes arayas in the category of basar v'chalav and shatnes, and the Gemara categorizes arayas as something that had the Torah not written, it, it would have been also like avodah zara and shvichas damim. So if you look in the Masar Sashats on the side of the page, the Masar Sashat says the Rambam and the Shemayinah Prakam apparently had a different girsa in the Gemara, where he grouped Arayos with Shatnis and Chazir, and not with Avodah Zara and, and Shvi Chazdamim. The Rambam must have had a different girsa than we have. Because again, our girsa groups Arayos as Mishpatim, and the Rambam groups Arayos as Chukim. So that means that he considered it normal behavior and we don't do it because it's a Chak? Yeah, imagine. meaning b- before the Torah was given, the Jews lived with Arayos, Amram lived with his aunt, Yaakov married two sisters. But we put it in the same category as Avodah Zerah and Shavich Hasdamim. No, that's our, Gemara, that's our Gemara, the Rambam didn't. The Rambam felt it was a chayk, the Rambam... It's saying, only Yeharag Val Yavar after the Torah was given, but before uh, the Torah was given... Okay, so I once heard from um, Rabbi Yonasan Sachs, the... Rav. Oh, so the Marshal wants to say 
that even though their chukim, what the Gemara means is, had the Torah not written it, it would still been Osir, it would have been Osir as the Sheva Mitzvahs. That's, what, that's how you could answer the Ramah. That that's, the Gemara doesn't mean it's a reasonable, logical mitzvah. The Gemara just means, had the Torah not written it, it would have been Osir as the Sheva Mitzvahs. That's what the Marsha says. So the, there's an interesting um, Rashbats on Pirkei Avais, who quotes over this Rambam, and the Rashbat says that when the Rambam says that uh, Arayos is a choik, he says, you know what type of Arayos we're talking about? We're talking about Lisa Achoisai. Lisa Achoisai. What does that mean, Lisa Achoisai? There are different types of Arayos. There could be some arayas are chukim, and some arayas are mishpatim. Marrying your sister. Why can't you marry your sister? Because you're not hurting anybody. You're not harming anybody. That was why came out. Why are you not to marry your sister? The answer is because the Torah said so. It's a chayk. That type of erva the Rambam categorizes as a chayk. But eshes ish, a married woman, that's a reasonable mitzvah. You're harming someone else. She's committed to somebody else. She's already taken. That's stealing. That's the highest form of stealing. That the Raman would agree to the Gemara in Yuma, that that's considered Mishpatim. So now, can marry your mother if your n- father passed away? Now we could have said, what? You can marry your mother if your father passed away? No, you can't. no because, but it's a chayk. It's no, a chayk. So Nobody would say yes. That, that's a chayk. Yeah. Now, um, we could have said, had it not been for the rush, that another example of where Arayos is a chayk, is why can't you marry your aunt and you could marry your niece? That would be another way to answer the Rambam. That normally Eishas is, is a mishpat, but the fact that you're not a marry Daidasa and you are allowed to marry Bas Achiv, that's a chayk. What's the difference? There's no difference between an aunt and a niece. According to the Rosh, it's not a chayk. According to the Rosh, there's a very clear rationale why you're not allowed to marry your uh, aunt and you are allowed to marry your niece. So be it as it may, the Tzava of Rabbi Yudah Chassid came along and said one should not marry their niece. In fact, in the Archais Rabbeinu, he brings a conversation that the stipler was having with Chazay Nish, and the Chazay Nish commented, he never saw anybody in Shaduchim violate the Tzava of Rabbi Yudah Chassid, and it worked out. In fact, You mean every time that they did, it didn't work out? He never saw it work out, correct. It never worked out. In fact, um, there's a particular scenario which, um, let's read it right now. Let's read it right now. There's a particular scenario. Number Number 61. Number 61. This is from the Archis Rabbeinu. So when I say that he never saw a situation where it worked out, so it, the, um, this is Archis Rabbeinu Chilake, page Yud Zayin to test. He says, Benagea l'shemos kala v'chamoisa. So the kala is called Malka, and the mother of the Bachar is called Malka Yenta. In other words, that's not just what her daughter-in-law called her. That was her name, Malka Yenta, you know? So her name was Malka Yenta. So... The problem is she's just called Malka. So the stipler said, L'chayr, it's a different name. But still, since they only call her Malka, the Iker name is the name they call her. So said the stipler, if the Shidduch, if everything is uh, good on paper and they like each other, the Kala should add a name. For example, Sara Malka. And she should be called this name 30 days before so that it becomes uh, well known that this is her new name. Another scenario, they asked, they're both their names were Malka, and the stipler said, better to name, name the Kala Esther Malka. Okay, Sarah Malka is okay, but he, fig- he says the name Esther Malka goes better. When you do that, if let's say Malka, she was named after her grandmother. Too bad. And now you call her Sarah Malka, it's not designed to the grandmother? Yeah, she'll get over it. You know? happy yeah, at least she's been waiting for this Chasa for a long time. And... If one of them is called Malka and one of them Malke, that's also a difference. That's also a difference. 
Okay. Next case. They asked Rav Shach. There was a woman named Zahava. And the mother-in-law is Golda. Is that a different enough name? For sure, right? Because we're all big Gedolim and Poiskim. So Rav Shach said he didn't know. And he said to ask the stipler. And the stipler said, he, the stipler agreed with you. And he said that the, the, one of the main concerns is that you don't mix up the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law. You're not going to mix up if they have a different name. Fine. Next case. There is a chasana. There is a, a there is a tnaim, an erison, and the mother in law don't have the same name. The chazonish said to add a name. Then he brings over here the stipler said the name of chazonish, and the Chaim, and they heard the same name of Chaim Brisk. If the mother and daughter have the same name, one of them should add a name. What about taking away name, Rabbi? What if they were both one second. Malka? And the name should be called, they should be called the new name and the old name together. And then they could get married. Are you allowed to take away name? One second, one second. Yeah, so let's say both Sir and Malka. And then you take away one, now you call it Malka. The other one is Sir and Malka. Then, Rav Chaim Kamiyaskiu said, in the name of the Chazaynish, that if the two of them have the same name, if they don't live in the same city, it's okay. Then here's the next case. This is what I was trying to get to. Rav Chaim Kamiyaskiu said over the following scenario. A daughter-in-law and mother-in-law from England, they have the same name. And they asked the stipler, and the stipler said the Kala should add a name. And they added it. A little while after the marriage, the chassan Nebuch came, uh, came down with a dreaded illness. And he was dwindling and dwindling mamish, sakonis nefashis. And the, um, they, they phoned the stipler to daven for him. And every, between each phone call, the, the situation of the chassan got worse and worse and worse. Um, and they asked the shliach, please ask the stipler, that I just mentioned to him, you told us to add a name, we did add a name, but we didn't really call him by the added name. Just mention that to the stipler. So the, the shliach told Reb Chaim, and Reb Chaim told the stipler. And the stipler said, oh, that's why he's sick. Because you added the name, but you didn't use the name. You didn't use it. What happened? Um, what happened? They started calling the name, and he immediately got out of his bed, and it disappeared immediately overnight. That's the story. So, you know, you hear that story, it's quite frightening. I mean, obviously, the stipler and the chazanish took this extremely seriously. On the other hand, Rabbi Vadi Yosef establishes what I think is a very important cloud in these type of things. And that is, you do not establish halacha based on isolated incidents. Do not, you can't live your life based on, oh, I know a story, somebody told me a nice story, this happened, and this and that. so therefore, all of a sudden the Torah was, uh, is changed by things that happen. Torah is either, is eternal. You do not change or alter, the halacha is not affected in any way by isolated incense. Let me read to you this inside number 56. He says, he says, um, the Ravadi writes in number 56, and we're, we're, we have to come to this because uh, Ravadi is talking about in Egypt, where they didn't know B'chalal about the Tzavah Rabbi Dachas, and it was common for brothers to marry sisters and uh, other Kroivim. That, that are mutter. So the, the Rav Avadya brings down a fifth line, Rav Agon, Rav Rachamim Chaim Yehudo Yisrael, Abezin of Drodos, writes, that in his city nobody cared about it until one Chacham came and he told people about it and he told about Yehuda Chassid and the Minog was Pasha Li Zohar. 
And basically the Rav HaMechaber who quotes this says that's the correct thing because he knows of a chassan who had the same name as his father-in-law and he died immediately the next day after the chassan. So you see it's a serious thing. Says Rav Avadya, and this is uh, words you have to be very courageous and, and um, brave poisek to say. Says Rav Avadya, Basic Chaim Yehuda Yisrael, meaning he should rest peacefully in his grave. But says Rav Avadya, Ein lilmoid mi mikra yechidi lelamed al kalkulay. Just because somebody got involved in a shidduch who violated Rav Yehuda Chassid and he died on the spot, does not indicate in any way that you're not allowed to do it or anybody else should refrain. What, is it, what does that have to do with halacha? You have to examine the halacha from an objective, rational basis based on the halachic principles and stories that happen in no way affect what the correct thing to do is. He says, um, uh, we'll, we'll read this a different time, but especially nowadays where the shidduch market is limited and people have a hard time finding their zivug, we're not going to scare them off and especially they don't know about the Tzava Rabbi Yudah to tell them about So let me tell you two stories, now that we said that stories don't mean anything. The Nitziv, the Zivug Sheni, who is the Nitziv married to? The Nitziv was married to the Arach HaShulchan sister. And when she passed away, he took, the Arach HaShulchan had a son named the Tartumimah, Tartamima's sister, his niece, the Natsiv, married his niece, the Zivik Sheni. The Natsiv. Gadol Hadar. Tell you another story. Imre Emes. His first wife died. Who did he go out with in a second? His niece. She said, Is this a good idea? He says, I promise you children. And Kachava, the Pnei Menachem. Was the, was the son of the Imre Yemes from in Zivik Sheni from his niece. So uh, many great gedolim from both spectrums, Litfish, Hasidish, did not concern themselves with this Sava of Rabbi Yudah Chassid. How about the Zivik Misha? What about it? What? They have the Zivik Misha, the first marriage. Oh. I hear, I hear, but it's a situation of Zivik Sheni where, uh, where they were going to have children, not just, you know, Zivik Sheni as a... Yeah, yeah, true. Tell me a story. I That's, before. Yeah, you don't take away names. You don't take away names. In order to, in order to be able to... You're allowed to? Different. It's not done. I think it's us, sir, but it's not done. Okay. So, um, be it as it may, so that's an interesting possibility in the Rabbi Huda HaChassid. Would Rabbi Vajra say differently if there was a distinct pattern? No. Here you had a Maisa where the Chassid died right away. No, it's not going to yeah, But if you had, you know, three, four, five situations like this, it wouldn't make a difference then. No, you don't pass in Halacha that way. Uh, we'll, we'll end off with one uh, a very interesting thing. In the Mesoyras Moshe, in the Masaris Moshe, which are the sort of the Minhagim of Rav Moshe, and different practices of Rav Moshe, here he brings down. Remember, we, we uh, Rabbi Yehuda Chassid said two brothers are not to marry two sisters, and one of the questions that the Naid of Yehuda raised on that was based on the Gemara in Brachas Mem Dalid that eighty Koyhanim brothers married eighty sisters, and uh, so the following story came to Rav Moshe. First of all, let's go to number 62. First of all, Ramosha got a Shaila. A woman had the same name as a mother-in-law, but they had different English names. So they asked Ramosha, is that okay? Ramosha said, that's fine. And then Ramosha quipped to the guy sitting next to him, you see what kind of ridiculous people, questions people ask today? People want to know about Sava Rabbi Huda Chassid. Who to give tzedakah money to? Where to send the kids to yeshiva? That nobody's asking. What do they want to know about the tzava of Rabbi Huda Chassid? But then, um, there were two brothers married to two sisters. And a third brother wanted to marry the third sister. Is that a bigger problem? So Moshe said, maybe taka, that fixes everything. Maybe taka, he says uh, all the way at the end of number 62, Mishu Acher Tzol Tzol Amar. 
שבייז אח הם נסו בייז אחייס. עכשיו אח שלישי, רויץ אליסה אחייס שלישיה. Now the third brother wants to marry the third sister. Im yesh b'zeh hakpada yisera, is there a, a bigger hakpada? So the Ramosha laughed. He said, maybe just the opposite. Maybe it cures the situation. The raya is, maybe that's the answer to Naidu Hudas Kasha. Naidu Hudas said, what do you mean? It says 80 brothers married. He says, right! It's just two can't, but 80? Once you're more than two, then it's, uh, everyone's a free agent. Well, what, what does it show you? If it's okay for the first and it's okay for the second, what would even be the happening? Maybe it's worse as you go along. Or maybe the second one, maybe the second one didn't care. The third one did care, so you wanted to know. So apparently, Rav Moshe Shita, when it came to all of this, was that if there's any discrepancy or difference whatsoever between this scenario and the scenario of Rav Yudha Chose, then, uh, then you're good to go. Okay, Rabbi Sai, we'll hold it over here. Shkayach. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.